Identity Crisis Identity Crisis is one of the most divisive storylines out there. Some hate it, while others love it. You see, after the success of Watchmen, DC wanted to send Justice League in a darker direction. So, in the face of a calamity, the leaguers begin doing shady stuff like mind-wiping. Identity Crisis deals with a lot of mature subjects and helps explore some of the League's darkest secrets. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. Identity Crisis Number 1 Deadly Secrets Private Hell Our story begins in Smallville where Jonathan and Martha Kent are spending some quality time with Clark. And as always, Ma Kent is busy swooning over her son's escapades, busy collecting newspaper articles about him. Every day there's an article about Clark in the papers. After all, he's Superman. And every day, Ma Kent cuts and adds a new piece to her collection. She loves her son, and more importantly, loves the team he's chosen to call his second family, the Justice League. She asks about Green Lantern, and Clark can't help but tell her all about him. Lantern's always been super nice to his family. Is he still handsome? Oh, he's always so handsome, says Clark's mother as she puts away the latest newspaper article about Clark. Clark agrees with her and then pulls out a sealed envelope from his pocket. It's the subscription fees Mark Kent sent to the Daily Planet, but Clark works there and he can cover the expenses himself. This, however, angers his mother, who's more than capable of paying her own subscription. She doesn't need Superman's help. At this point in the comic, the writer's direction and dark tale on DC superhero seeps through. Mark Kent orders Clark to not step in when she sends the check again, but he plans on doing exactly that. This is when Mark Kent says, I bet Batman never does this to his parents, and this leaves Clark speechless. A dark joke on the writer's part, and it's only foreshadowing for what's to come as we dive further into the story. Before Clark can say anything, the Justice League signal device buzzes in his pocket. He's annoyed that the League has called him on his day off, but when he sees the alert, he knows it's important that he depart at this very moment. Within the next second, Clark has changed into his Superman costume and is ready to leave. I have to go. Pa, do me a favor. Lock all the doors and windows. Something's clearly amiss. At the same time, in Gotham City, Dick Grayson, aka Nightwing, is in the city graveyard, staring at his father and mother's gravestones. It's his parents' anniversary, and Nightwing always makes sure to visit them on this day. The wind above his head whizzes, and someone's flown in to meet Dick. He doesn't have to turn around to find out who it is. He can smell her jasmine scent in the air. It's Starfire, his former flame. She's dated Nightwing for years, and knows today would be hard on him, which is why she's here to keep him company. Nightwing wants to say something tough, something Bruce would say in this situation, but he holds back. It's nice to have someone by your side on tough days, especially if it's someone as lovely as Corey, aka Starfire. Their moment together is, however, short-lived as his back communicator buzzes the very next second. It's Barbara Gordon, aka the Oracle, on the other side. Dick, turn your signal around. We've got some bad news. The string of calls continues as every member of the League is called in. We're now in Star City, and it's Oliver's turn next, aka Green Arrow. He's busy sparring with his son. Connor Hawk. Oliver's age is catching up to him, and his son is only growing stronger and stronger. This becomes pretty apparent when we learn that Oliver's already fallen on his back twice while holding the boxing bag, as Connor continues to train. Ted Grant, aka Wildcat, a superhero vigilante with the power of resurrection and super strength, joins them as they spar. Ted and Oliver are close friends, and as the duo session comes to an end, Green Arrow begins putting on his costume and packing his gear. He urges Wildcat to get ready as well, and we learn where they're going. To Ralph Dibney's house, aka Elongated Man. Each year, his wife Sue sets up a surprise party for Ralph, and this year, Oliver's part of it. He's the designated showgirl, so to speak, and he's supposed to jump out of the cake at the end of the party. This is when his Justice League signal device buzzes, which is picked up by Connor, who's been carrying it for Oliver ever since he was given one. What's wrong? Another sentient galaxy attacking? Asks his dad, but Connor's too shaken to reply. When he finally gathers himself, he says, to Dad, I, uh, I think the party just got cancelled. Let's now travel back in time. 30 minutes to be exact and check in with Elongated Man and Firehawk in Opal City. The two of them are perched on a rooftop as we learn that they're out on a stakeout. Their eyes are glued to a wooden box, which seems to be abandoned in an alley until we learn about the two goons trying to sell it, Benny Addison and Trey Williams. A bunch of young thugs still inexperienced and too stupid for their own good. Ralph and Firehawk know that whatever's in the box is valuable and it's for sale tonight. All the two have to do is wait, wait for the buyer to show up. Ralph's nose is known to twitch every time he senses a villain nearby, and it's been going wild tonight. He's one of the few superheroes who doesn't wear a mask, which is why his real identity has always been public. And when he tells Firehawk about his nose twitching, she doesn't seem to believe him. 
Green Arrow once told her that it was something Ralph had made up to get more press. Ralph looks at Firehawk with disappointment and a hint of anger dripping from his eyes. Green Arrow has a bald spot, that's why he wears a hat. And that's it. That's the end of the discussion as the two of them go back to keeping an eye on the box in silence. To break the ice and the awkwardness, Firehawk asks Ralph about his wife, Sue. How'd the two of them meet? She wants to know. Ralph sighs. It's this question that every woman has asked him on a stakeout. Everyone except the Power Girl. Batman never asked this question once, nor did Hal or anyone else for that matter. But Firehawk isn't someone to back down. She asks him again with a smirk on her face this time. So, how do you meet her? This is one of the problems of having a public identity. Everyone wants to know and be updated about a superhero's love life. Ralph goes on to tell Firehawk that he met Sue in the most boring way possible. They met in a crowded room. And all Sue had to do was simply notice elongated man across the room, and that was that. Firehawk doesn't believe him, but that's the thing. Ralph never lies when it comes to Sue. Didn't you uh, crash your debutante ball or something, then uh, fall in love at first sight, or something vomity like that? And she's right. Ralph did crash Sue's debutante ball, but what made him fall for her wasn't her looks. It was the fact that she didn't notice the flash barge in at the ball. She was busy staring into Ralph's eyes. This wasn't a normal thing. Barry was in his prime back then. And for a girl to not notice the flash when with elongated man, <laughs> this was something Ralph had never seen happen before. It was like competing with Sinatra. But that's why ice cream stores don't just sell chocolate and vanilla. Every once in a while, someone walks in and orders butter pecan. Ralph reminisces as he remembers the day he met Sue. He snaps back to reality and is surprised to see Firehawk grinning at him as she stares at his face. What? asks Ralph, and Firehawk says, They told me you'd get mushy about her. Ralph can't help it. If she knew Sue, she'd know he has every right to get mushy about her. Ralph remembers how Sue met everyone but still only had eyes for him. Batman, Flash, Arthur, Hal. Huh. She's seen Hawkman with the hairy chest thing going on. Come on. She's looked directly into Superman's Melt Your Heart Baby Blues. Huh. And she still chose me. Ralph can't help but smile like a teenage boy in the present day as he averts his gaze from Firehawk. Firehawk is touched by Ralph's love for his wife. And she can't help but crave something like this for herself. Her entire head goes up in flames as she pulls her legs closer to her chest and sulks away. But Firehawk is still curious. She wants to know if the mystery thing is true, if Sue actually makes it a point to surprise Ralph on each of his birthdays. Ralph then tells her that it's the reason he was pushed out of the house today to go out on a patrol. He hasn't gone on a patrol since he joined the League. Although his birthday is months away, she thinks she can surprise him by holding the bash early. Ralph isn't a superhero because of his powers. He's a superhero because he's a great detective. He already knows she's trying to pull an old stunt he's already fallen for in the past. Years ago, she'd gotten the Flash to dress up as an old man to surprise him. She's doing the same this year with Green Arrow. Ralph's always known what Sue's been up to, but he's never let her efforts go to waste. If his lady's going through all this trouble to surprise him, then you can bet Ralph is going to act surprised each year. I still can't believe it. The Daily Planet ran a whole section on those mysteries, and now all these years you knew. The two of them turn their gaze back toward the wooden box as they watch the two goons become impatient with each passing second. Trey and Benny argue if the buyer will actually show up. Benny wants to check what's inside the wooden box and keep it for himself. Trey, on the other hand, knows that it's a bad idea and that they should wait for the buyer to get rid of it. Carrying it around with them will only attract more trouble. Unbeknownst to them, their buyer is already there and is parked across the street. It's Bolt, a businessman with the power of teleportation thanks to his suit. He's talking on his phone, and Noah Cutler, formerly known as Calculator, is on the other side of it. He was a low-life thug and minor villain that had run around pressing buttons on his calculator suit. Everybody thought of him as a moron, but that all changed the day when he heard about the Oracle. Still considered a myth among villains, nobody knows who the Oracle is or how she feeds information to the Bat family and other heroes. But this was enough for Noah to devise his own plan. He'd always been good at gathering information, which is why he decided to monetize it. He now sells information to villains across cities, which is why he's on the line with Bolt. We find out Bolt wants to know who the two kids are, but Noah isn't giving away any information unless he pays and his current account has run dry. Bolt then hands over his account in Latvia along with its password, and he's back in business. Noah tells him about Trey and Benny, and how their real names are Benny Addison and Travon Williams. Both are low-life thugs and have been in and out of juvenile detention centers since they became teenagers. Bolt then wants to know if the boys are armed, and even this information is gonna cost him. Noah really means business when it comes to selling information. Bolt reluctantly pays him and Noah goes on to reveal what he knows. There's an 18% chance that the boys are armed as Benny's older brother was working for the Penguin. Bolt then asks the question he's been dreading all this while. He knows there's bound to be superheroes around, and he wants to know who they are. But Bolt has run out of money. He's only got $800 in his account now. Noah cuts him some slack and decides to only charge him $800 this time. Noah has been keeping tabs on all the phone calls made in the neighborhood, 
and most calls have been made to the news stations, reporting the presence of elongated man and firehawk. Bolt sits in his car and contemplates that this could end up being his last job if he doesn't account for every minor factor. When Noah asks why he can't just teleport and get the box, Bolt tells him that he doesn't have the power to teleport with something that huge. It's the reason he's brought his car today. Back on the rooftop, Firehawk asks the elongated man how he deals with his identity being public. After all, all of them have tons of enemies, and all of them are bound to target his family, especially Sue. Elongated Man knows that. It's the reason why he had Sue live in the Justice League headquarters all those years. His apartment's now decked with the top security systems of the world. Thanagarian technology, Martian technology, Kryptonian technology, you name it, Elongated Man's apartment has it. It even has all the upgrades Steel managed to steal from the mother bucks. Hmm, maybe she should get you a nuclear bunker for your birthday. But Elongated Man knows what she's got him this time. He's always one step ahead. Sue and Ralph passed by an antique store recently where an old magnifying glass caught Ralph's eye. Sue pretended to walk ahead, but Ralph could see her memorizing the shop's name in the reflection. We head to Ralph and Sue's apartment where she has indeed bought him the magnifying glass he was ogling earlier. Sue holds up the magnifying glass as she talks on the phone. Yeah, it had just got here, Alfred. <laughs> Thanks for helping me track it down. I never would have remembered the name of the shop. Sue puts the phone down and we see her slide something else into the gift box. Sue knows Ralph's a detective, which is why he must have already figured out that she's getting him the magnifying glass. But he'll never be able to guess the other gift she slipped inside the box. She smirks to herself, but then suddenly hears a loud thud downstairs. Hello? She calls out as she apprehensively approaches the stairs. Back in the alley where Trey and Benny are waiting for their buyer, it's been another 30 minutes, and the sun has now set. Bolt still sits in his car contemplating his choices when we see Benny move toward the box. He's had enough, and he's sure that the buyer has ditched them. He's now going to keep the box all to himself, but before he does that, he's going to have a look inside. As the young thug moves toward the box, we see Bolt teleport and disappear from his car. He appears in front of the two boys the very next second. Ralph and Firehawk's moment has finally arrived, and they eagerly watch the scene unfold from the rooftop. In the alley, meanwhile, Benny is tired of Bolt's tricks. First, he makes them wait for hours, and now he decides to show up out of nowhere and scare them. You better have our money! Trey screams, and Bolt simply smiles viciously. The boys realize that Bolt doesn't plan to pay them at all, but he failed to account for one thing, that the boys came prepared for this job. As soon as Bolt utters his words, Benny and Trey each pull out two guns, one in each hand. Four barrels are now pointed at Bolt, who thinks the boys are bluffing. But the two young thugs open fire the very next second as Firehawk and Ralph look on in horror. The two of them jump toward the alley, but that's when Ralph gets an emergency call. It's Sue. Ralph picks it up mid-leap as he tries to make out what's happening. We see Bolt crash against the wooden box he was here to pick up as the boys continue to pepper him with bullets. Back at Ralph's apartment, Sue is also thrown against a table simultaneously. And as Bolt leaks blood from every bullet hole, we see Sue lie motionless on a broken table back at the apartment. Everything unfolds like some twisted coincidence as Ralph screams for Sue, fearing the worst. He doesn't care about Bolt or what the kids did. Not anymore! And wants Firehawk to fly him back to the apartment at full speed. Firehawk hesitates. She can't turn off the flames in her hand. She'll burn Ralph if she does that. Fly me home now! Ralph screams as we see the broken magnifying glass back at the apartment. Sue lies on the floor, motionless, bleeding from her mouth as a mysterious shadow looms over her with a flamethrower. Goodbye, Sue, the shadow says. Back in the alley, Bolt lies in a pool of his own blood, coughing seriously as we watch flames engulf Sue back at the apartment. Trey and Benny flee the scene in a hurry. Benny leaves, but Trey stays there. Despite his tough demeanor, his real self has now come to the surface. He's horrified, terrified at what they've just done. What's wrong with you, you friggin' psychos? Bolt says as he looks up at Trey, still coughing blood. Trey wants to leave before the cops show up, but Bolt begs him to call an ambulance. Maybe it was Bolt's quivering voice. Maybe it was the pool of blood at his feet. Or maybe, just maybe, it was the bit of good that was still left inside Trey. Because he calls an ambulance the very next second, and after the call, he stays there with Bolt. We see Firehawk carrying Ralph through the air as they finally reach outside the apartment building. But before he can even land, Ralph has elongated his body and is already scanning for Sue, screaming for Sue as he makes his way upstairs. As he turns a corner, he sees the apartment flooded with water from the fire sprinklers, and as he looks toward the floor, he sees Sue's motionless feet peeking out from behind the broken table. And that's when it hits him. His worst nightmare has come true. Tears stream down his face as Ralph stretches himself as far as possible to reach Sue. But it's over. It's all over. He loses control over his body, which stretches up normally as he lets out a cry of grief while holding Sue. The left side of her body has been completely burned to a crisp, and beside her body is his birthday gift, now broken. And inside the magnifying glasses box, a positive pregnancy test, and a note from Sue that says, Daddy, 
two lines is equal to positive. An hour later, we see Robin, aka Tim Drake, enter his apartment back from his nightly patrol. His father, Jack Drake, now lives with him and found out about his secret identity a week ago. Robin has fought the Mad Hatter today, and adrenaline is still coursing through his veins, making him more jittery than usual. Robin would kill to share his nightly escapades with his father, but he's been too worried. His old man has been struggling to come to terms with his son's crime-fighting endeavors. His father looks at him longingly, asking if Robin was shot at by anyone tonight. Tim brushes off the comment and asks his father to never worry about him. He takes a seat beside his dad, and suddenly the show his dad was watching is stopped for an emergency news broadcast. It's the report about Sue's murder, and Jack instantly knows his son will have to leave again. He pulls Tim closer for a hug as the news continues playing in the background. We now head to Ivy Town, specifically to the office of Gene Loring, Ray Palmer, aka Atom's ex-wife. His wife's a lawyer, and as he jumps out of the telephone in his smaller form, he knows that he's screwed. Being an hour late isn't something Gene will take too kindly. We learn that Ray's there to sign papers, papers for his patents. Gene won half of them during the divorce settlement but is now signing them back to him. It's her twisted way of showing Ray that she's an independent woman. Ray signs the papers and asks about the architect she's been dating. Even though Gene and him have broken up, a slight smile spreads across Atom's face. But before he can say anything else, his Justice League scanner buzzes and it's Green Arrow on the other side. He learns about Sue's death and informs Gene about the same. He needs to go, but Gene wants to go with him. The two of them have been friends for more than ten years. But before Gene can say any more, Atom has shrunk down and leaped into the phone already. It's now been four hours since Sue's murder, and we see Green Arrow arrive at the crime scene. If this would have happened before Superman's death, things would have been different. But since then, the Justice League has organized itself for such unfortunate events. They made contingency plans, notifications and contact charts so that the Justice League could organize and get to the bottom of any event without a hitch. As Green Arrow approaches the front door of the apartment, he asks Oracle about Dr. Magnus's whereabouts and she informs him that everything is on schedule. When Green Arrow reaches the front door, he sees a note addressed directly to him from Batman. Ollie, crime scene's done. Results soon. Just don't touch anything. Bruce has already been here, but Green Arrow knows he's got to investigate the crime scene in his own way. Oracle tells him that Bruce couldn't find any signs of entry. No tampering with the security systems, and not even a fiber in the room was moved since Ralph had discovered the murder. Even though Bruce and Ralph, the two biggest detectives, have gone through the crime scene, Green Arrow knows what death does to a person. And even though they both have superpowers, they're only human. This is why Green Arrow is here, to investigate the murder in his own way. He opens the door and says, Okay, boys. Time to do it right, and we see he isn't alone. He's brought along the best of the best. Mr. Miracle, Atom, Doc Magnus, and Animal Man. Mr. Miracle is the universe's best escape artist, and so he can look for ways someone would have entered the room. The Atom can shrink himself to a tiny size and then look for any clues that Bruce or Ralph could have missed. The Ray can do spectrum analysis while Doc Magnus's toys can focus on metallurgy. As for Animal Man, he can pick up any unknown scents in the apartment, a scent that might belong to the killer. Oliver had to call a lot of cops to keep them away, but they all understood. Killing a cop gets you the entire police force, killing a superhero gets you the entire Justice League, and killing a superhero's wife? Well, Oliver hopes that whoever did this gets caught by the police before they get to him. Two days later, at noon, is Sue's funeral. It's being held in Central City, the place where Ralph and Sue first met each other. We see Green Arrow, Hawkman, and the Flashy silhouettes loom over Sue's coffin. They want to carry it out the traditional way, and joining them is Sue's uncle, and he'll be carrying it from the back corner, where it's the heaviest. None of them argue even though Hawkman could carry the entire thing by himself, and even he stays quiet. On the count of three, the four of them pick up the coffin and start walking out. We then see the entire church packed to the brim with superheroes, police officers, and civilians. Officers help maintain a barrier between civilians and superheroes. Each and every one attending the funeral is there in their costume, protecting their identity. If exposed, their families could be the next ones. Most of the people in the crowd can't contain themselves. Aquaman stands there with his head lowered. Diana has come in the traditional Amazonian garb for funerals, and Starfire can't contain herself once Sue's family bursts into tears. And Ralph? The poor man has been a mess ever since the murder happened. Everyone attending the funeral is on their feet as the coffin is carried in, and when Oliver glances at Ralph, he knows his friend is losing control over his powers. Any moment, he could lose control over his elastic body. The four of them gently place the coffin down as Oliver remembers Sue's contributions to the League. The League was her and Ralph's life ever since she was inducted into it. They stuck together longer than anyone in the League. Sue was even an honorary member. Something she was bestowed once the League went international. It was a mantle that even Lois hadn't been bestowed 
road with the end. Oliver remembers that it was his close friend Barry who said it the best. Even though Clark and Bruce were the bricks of the league, Sue and Ralph were the mortar. They held everyone and everything together. After placing the coffin, Green Arrow slumps into a seat in the corner, still lost in his thoughts. It's Diana who takes to the mic to deliver Sue's eulogy. She knew her the best, but Green Arrow doesn't hear a word of it. He's too zoned out. Green Arrow knows Diana's eulogy is nothing short of perfection, but he's too consumed by the investigation. He's been gathering clues all this while, and we learn that from the initial report, Pots. It seems Sue succumbed to third-degree burns that covered almost 42% of her body. They've been narrowing down suspects as there are only a few villains that could have entered the apartment without triggering any sensors or opening any doors or windows. The apartment was even lined with a Thanagarian device that could detect if someone phases in or out, so that only leaves villains that can teleport as suspects. This means it could either be Warp, Bolt, Mirror Master, Peekaboo, or Shade. They're all at large, quite difficult to capture and near impossible to lock up. Green Arrow snaps back to reality when Diana finishes her speech her voice begins to crack, but she holds her tears back. Diana doesn't plan on crying. She won't give the world that luxury. Goodbye, sister. She says one last time as she places her hand on the coffin and leaves the podium. The moment that Ralph has been dreading is here. It's now his time to say goodbye to Sue. He gets up from his seat, shaking, and walks over to the podium with his face buried in his hand. He just stands there for 30 seconds or so as tears begin to stream down everyone's face. A minute passes by, and despite Hawkman and Oliver's encouragement, he can't do it. His elastic skin begins to lose control as he weeps endlessly. He just can't do it. Everyone rushes to help him, and Ralph slumps into Starfire's arms. Every hero is hell-bent on revenge, and teams form quickly right there and then in the church. Titans believe the murder was carried out by the Brotherhood, so they decide to go after Plasmus and Warp. The old Justice League International decides to hunt down Firefly and Scorch. The Outsiders decide to go after Heatstroke, the Martian Manhunter, and Aquaman. The two heroes who have suffered great personal losses decide to go after Mirror Master. Oliver's never seen the two of them this angry. As for the Justice Society, they decide to chase after Dr. Phosphorus. Heatwave has the Beatles crew coming after him. The rest of the Justice League, alongside Clark and Diana, go after Bolt. This leaves Zatanna, Hawkman, Green Arrow, Black Canary, Atom, and Elongated Man in the church. Oliver knows that picking these villains were amazing guesses, but the four of them have a hunch. They know who's behind the murder. Ralph told them to meet him in a private chapel after everyone's left, and that's where the four of them are headed right now. This secret, whatever it is, has weighed down Oliver for years. He's kept it from Clark, Bruce, from Diana. Well, because his colleagues wouldn't understand. Are they gone yet? Asks Ralph as his friends enter the private chapel in the back. They confirm that everyone's gone and Oliver can notice the change in Ralph's demeanor. His shoulders are now straight and he's in full control of his body. Satana tries to soothe him down, but Ralph says, Come on, Z. We all know who did this. We never put it in the League archives, but we were all there. Whoever he is is gonna have to face Ralph's full wrath. Ralph wants to break the murderer for wrecking his life once again. He sheds the few tears left in him and then turns around and screams, Help me find Dr. Light! Rage and the thirst for revenge drips from every pore of elongated man, and Dr. Light better say goodbye to his loved ones for the last time. But nobody can imagine what Ralph will do to him once he's been caught. Identity Crisis Number 2 Power Packed Ivy Town in Ray's old home. Gene stands looking over Ray as he rummages through his old stuff, desperately trying to find something. Gene tries to ask him what he's doing, asks him about what he's searching for, but Ray doesn't say anything. He just keeps looking. Soon he gives up, transforms into the atom, his smaller self, as he jumps into the trunk. Finally, he's found what he's looking for. And as he grows back to his normal size, we see that it's a crossbow. He hands over the crossbow to Jean and tells her that it's already loaded. All she needs to do is point and shoot. Turns out Ray has been worried about her, and he came all this way to Ivy Town to make sure his ex-wife was okay, to make sure that she was ready and armed in case someone decided to go after her. Jean can't believe it. After all these years, after the divorce, the physicist she fell in love with still cares for her. The look of surprise in her eyes doesn't go unnoticed by Ray either, but he has work to do, and it's time to leave now. Whatever you're up to, Ray, please be careful, Jean says as she watches her ex-husband leave. She too is worried about him now. He's back at the church now, the one where Sue's funeral was held in the afternoon, and now everyone's ready and armed to the teeth. Ralph's getting ready in his costume when for a second Oliver wonders if Dinah should stay back for this one. She, on the other hand, isn't having any of it. After all, it was him, Green Arrow, who died and came back, not her. But before they can leave, something catches Hawkman's eye. He glares at the wall beside him and barks orders. Stop right there. I see you, Wally. The Flash has been using his super speed to turn invisible and snoop in on the conversations all this while. Oliver's too smart for the kids. He knows that if Wally's here, then Kyle, aka the Green Lantern, is bound to be here too. Oliver calls him out and his bluff is right. Kyle's been there all this while as well. 
Hawkman and Wally go at it as Carter can't believe that the kids are spying on them. Atom stands atop his shoulder in his smaller form, but Wally is still seething and angry. The Flash can't believe that the six of them lied to everyone. He's been listening in on the conversation ever since everyone left. He was smart enough to notice that everyone had left the chapel except the six of them, and whatever it is that they did all those years back, he wants to know. This irks Ralph, who quickly extends his neck to face Wally and barks at the young man to leave this matter alone. Kyle tries to keep a calm head as he tells everyone that Wally and he are on their side. They just want to know how the sixth of them are so sure that it's Dr. Light who committed Sue's murder. Oliver tries to lie to them, but Wally isn't having any of it. He threatens to call in Clark, or better yet, Bruce. Think I'm bluffing? Ollie, try me, please. Oliver then sighs, looks at Ralph, and says, Okay, Ralph, why don't you tell? Black Canary tries to protest, but Oliver cuts her off. The kids have now grown up, and it's time that they face the grim realities that come with being a part of the League. Oliver wants them to know why they think Dr. Light did it, but he doesn't plan on wasting any time. He wants Ralph to tell them everything on the way to Dr. Light's hideout. And so, Ralph begins remembering the past as he tells the story to Kyle and Wally. We're now taken into a flashback at the satellite, out of which the Justice League used to operate. All of the heroes were down on Earth fighting Hector Hammond, and Sue was alone in it back then. Of course, Dr. Light didn't know this back then, but he knew the satellite was empty, which is why he thought it was the perfect opportunity. All six of them still debate what made Dr. Light sneak into the satellite that day. Maybe he was there to sabotage their base. Maybe he wanted to hide and wait for the heroes to show up. Or maybe he was there to get his old light gun back from their trophy room. Whatever it was, Dr. Light ended up finding something far more valuable. Sue. Dr. Light never had the power to defeat the Justice League face to face, so he decided to hurt them where it would hurt the most. As he stalked Sue like a predator, she tried to fight back by showing him that she'd already pressed the emergency button. The heroes could be here any second. But Dr. Light's eyes drip with hunger and anger menacingly as Ralph says in the present day, She told me she fought. I hope she fought. Years later, I found out that she was up there simply because she was bored. And from the satellite, at least she could get a great view of the stars. That's all she wanted. Quiet night looking at the stars. We see it's Barry, the fastest man on Earth to be the first one at the scene. But by the time he arrives, it's already too late. Barry throws Dr. Light across the room within a microsecond, but the deed is done. Dr. Light looks insane as he turns around and says, It's your weakness, isn't it? I finally got it! The man has clearly gone insane, but before he can say anything else, Green Lantern uses his powers to punch him across the face. The very next second, two arrows lodge in his body courtesy of the Green Arrow, and Atom jumps in to throw one of his atomic punches. The others are here now, but it's already too late, and although his body is punctured, Beaten and broken, Dr. Light still can't let go of his lunacy. I'll find her again, you know. Then I'll find all yours. But this is enough to send rage seeping through every Justice League member as all of them pounce on him. Hawkman holds him in a headlock as Dr. Light tries to strangle the Black Canary. Satana pulls on his cape in the background desperately as Oliver and Hal wrestle the insane man to the ground. Barry stands guard over Sue as she watches everything unfold while lying on the floor. Suddenly, someone hits Dr. Light in the face with a mace, knocking him out instantly. The rest of them look up in disappointment as they realize it's Ralph. They've all failed him. He tears up as he realizes what's happened. In the very next second, he wraps his arms around Sue on the floor as she sobs uncontrollably. It's okay, Bun. I got gotcha. you. You're safe. All of them look on with sad eyes as they feel disappointed and disheartened for having failed their friend. Present day Ralph tells Kyle and Wally that they transported Sue to the hospital the very next second. Ralph looks away, longingly. The weight of that night still drooping from his eyes as Wally watches his face, clearly concerned and horrified for the man. He had no idea what Ralph had been living through, what he'd just been through now that Sue was dead. They're in Roxbury, Massachusetts, the last known hideout of Dr. Light. Wally can't believe that Light's capable of such heinous crimes. I fought Light a dozen times. He was always a moron. Oliver completes his sentence. His eyes hint that there's more to this story than they're letting on. Oliver goes on to tell Wally that Dr. Light wasn't always that way. He wasn't always a moron. Wally and Kyle soon realize that Oliver's hinting at something, and even Ralph joins them. He doesn't know what happened with Dr. Light after he took Sue to the hospital. Oliver tries to handle this calmly, urging them to see their truth, but they have to understand the situation he and the others were put in. And this is when Green Arrow's flashback starts. We see Hawkman, Black Canary, Satana, Atom, Green Lantern, and Flash try to contain Dr. Light who's clearly gone insane. Blood and foam drips from his mouth as Hawkman restrains him in place. Despite being overpowered, the man has been driven insane. He's screaming, I'll find her again! I swear it, it'll be easy! This is the part they didn't tell anyone about, not even Ralph himself. Hawkman asks Green Lantern to take care of Light, and Hal instantly restrains his hands and neck in heavy chains. But the insane man's ramblings continue. 
He's hell-bent on finding Sue again, finding out where she lives, finding out everyone's loved ones. He can see Barry's wedding ring under his costume. In the present day, Oliver tells the kids that they'd never seen this kind of insane, even in Arkham Asylum. Green Lantern suggests locking up Dr. Light, but this only plays into his fantasies further. Dr. Light can't wait to tell this story to everyone in the prison. He then hints that he can even use his powers to project what happened tonight for the world to see, and that's the last straw for Hawkman. He orders Zatanna to wipe his memories using her powers, and she instantly puts him to sleep. She then approaches his head to wipe his memories, but Hawkman is still hesitant. He wonders if wiping Dr. Light's memories would be enough. Even if they wipe his memories, it won't change the man he is. It won't change the level of insanity they've seen today. Hawkman wants Zatanna to not only wipe Light's memories, but maybe change him a little, clean him up, maybe. This is something they haven't tried before, but the risk of letting Light loose as is far outweighs the consequences of what they plan on doing. Oliver doesn't want to go through with it, and soon each of them picks sides. Hawkman and Zatanna want to change and alter Light's mind while Green Lantern, Green Arrow, and Black Canary are against it. This leaves Barry to be the deciding vote between the two teams, and we see the fastest man on Earth slow down for a few seconds as he contemplates his choice. In the present day, Wally can't believe Barry sided with Hawkman, that he voted to mess with Light's head, but Oliver tells him that this happened only six months after Iris's death. We switch back to the flashback and watch Barry agree to alter Dr. Light's mind. Back in the present, Wally is disappointed by the choice Barry made, but Zatanna tells him that lobotomizing Dr. Light was never the plan. This was the first time she was attempting to do something like this, shift someone's personality. She didn't mean to make him dumb, turn him into a moron, but that's what happened. Oliver and Hawkman have their eyes focused on Dr. Light's apartment, while Zatanna rethinks her life choices. Wally and Kyle can't believe that this is what happened to Dr. Light. You're insane! You're all insane! says Kyle, and that's when Hawkman spots Dr. Light teleport into his apartment. It's time they took him down. Green Lantern helps Oliver, Zatanna, and Black Canary fly toward the apartment while Wally uses his arms to fly down. Atom's hitching a ride on his shoulder, but instead of focusing on the task at hand, Wally is too busy condemning what Oliver and the rest did. Kyle says, He's not wrong, Ali. I mean, even if it was the only time you guys messed with someone's head. And that's when Oliver looks up at him. What? And then Oliver says, what makes you think it was the only time? All of them are so busy fighting and arguing with each other that they forget why they're here. But Ralph hasn't. By the time they realize their mistake, Ralph has already stretched himself and is inside the apartment ready to face light. Sadly, however, he's knocked out of the apartment by an explosion the very next second. They hear footsteps and then watch as orange boots walk out of the dark apartment. It's their worst nightmare. Deathstroke. Dr. Light steps out from behind and it turns out Light has hired Slade to protect him. The moron isn't a moron, after all. Back at the headquarters, Dr. Midnight, the league's go-to medical examiner, is now ready to perform Sue's autopsy, and it's revealed that Sue's body was never in the hearse that left the funeral. It was instead brought straight to the headquarters. He spent the last hour warming up the body as it was stored in ice, and now as he makes his first cut, he realizes things aren't as they seem. Oh, no, says the doctor as he calls up Oracle. He wants Oracle to find Ralph and contact him as soon as possible. Uh, Doc, haven't you seen the news? Asks Oracle. Of course he hasn't seen the news. He's been busy prepping for the autopsy. It's then that the Oracle tells him that Ralph and the older members of the League have been fighting Deathstroke and Dr. Light just outside of Boston. Dr. Midnight then realizes that they think Dr. Light has committed the murder. He wants Oracle to patch him through to Ralph, but she's already been trying to contact them for the past 10 minutes. But each one of them has turned off their signal devices. Oracle asks him what the problem is, and Dr. Midnight tells her that Sue supposedly died from carbon monoxide poisoning after being burned, but if that were the case, her lungs should be filled with soot. They should be black. They're not? Asks a confused Oracle, and the doctor says, I'm staring at them right now. They're pink. The doctor then goes on to tell the Oracle that there's not a single black spot in Sue's lungs. This can only mean one thing, that Sue was dead long before the fire broke out, which means they're all going after the wrong guy. Sue wasn't killed by Dr. Light. Identity Crisis Number 3, Serial Killer We're now in Roxbury, Massachusetts, where Green Arrow, Black Canary, Hawkman, Green Lantern, the Flash and Zatanna face off against Deathstroke and Dr. Light. A few minutes ago, Elongated Man tried to infiltrate Dr. Light's apartment but was knocked out by an explosion. This isn't Deathstroke's fight, but for the amount Dr. Light is paying, he couldn't say no. Oliver knows Slade's capabilities, and this face-off, seven against one, barely evens them out. He notices Slade's mask shift slightly and realizes that the assassin is smiling underneath it. The Flash is the first one to react, but Deathstroke has his every move planned out. He triggers a manual switch, which in turn fires off explosions all around him. 
Oliver realizes the C5 was expertly placed to avoid Wally's powers, one on Deathstroke's left, one on his right, and one directly in front of him. Wally's too fast for the explosions, and he just zips around them. Sadly, this is exactly what Deathstroke wanted. He narrowed down Wally's movements, and now, with a quick thrust of his blade, he stabs the Flash directly under his right shoulder blade. New costume. Same old mistakes, says the assassin before twisting the blade to make sure Wally is down for this fight. He then leaps through the air, but before Oliver can react, Deathstroke slams into the ground beside Zatanna and punches her in the gut, pushing his fingers deep beneath her ribcage. Zatanna is the most powerful among them, but that's only if she can speak and cast her spells. Slade just took that ability away by targeting her liver, and just like he'd planned, Zatanna is coughing up blood and bile the very next second. Oliver sees why he's one of the best assassins in the world. He calculates and fights just like Bruce. Deathstroke goes for Hawkman next, who's ready to face Slade. He flies toward Deathstroke, ready to slam him down with his mace, but Slade isn't attacking him. He's going for his wings. Slade uses his sword to slice across Carter's chest, which cuts the straps to his wings, and he smacks into the pavement below instantly. It's now time for Oliver to face Deathstroke, but as he lets loose his arrow, Slade expertly blocks it using his staff. Slade is about to swing his sword for Oliver's throat, but the green arrow manages to quickly duck. However, all this? All this is all part of Deathstroke's plan. His sword slices the feathers off of each arrow in Oliver's quiver. The Black Canary tries to take him by surprise as she draws in a deep breath behind Slade, but he knows exactly what to do next. He pulls out a mask from his pocket and jumps toward Dinah, covering her face and tying it up the very next second. He then handcuffs her and leaves her on the floor. There's only one more member of the League he needs to take down, and that is Atom. He looks around, anticipating the Atom any second, and when he spots Ray Palmer, Slade pulls out a laser pointer and shoots it directly at the Doctor. The Atom might be a force to be reckoned with at his microscopic size, but that also makes him susceptible to everyday forces that aren't an issue for normal-sized humans, like a laser pointer. The laser propels Atom towards Hawkman at incredible speeds, which is exactly what Deathstroke wanted. Ray instinctively grows to his normal size to avoid being burned to death by the laser but this only knocks him and Hawkman out as they crash into each other. That's it then. Deathstroke just took out the team's most powerful members using a laser pointer. There's only one man left now, and Kyle isn't going down without a fight. He throws a punch at Deathstroke, wielding the power of his ring, but Slade catches his fist instantly. He then grips the base of his wrist with his other hand and twists, breaking Kyle's each finger instantly. He then wrestles Kyle's arm toward the ground, hoping to get the ring to simply fall off of his broken finger. But this is it. Oliver's had enough. He jumps on Slade's shoulders and stabs him directly in his right eye using one of his broken arrows. Oliver then tears off Slade's mask, and it's the first time we see the assassin scream in pain and rage. Oliver has stabbed Slade in his blind eye, and he knows how much that'll hurt the assassin. Slade screams, I'll kill you for that, and he leaps for Oliver's throat. This is exactly what the Green Arrow wanted. The master strategist has finally lost his cool, and it's now time for his friends to capitalize on the opening. Slade punches Oliver multiple times until his team is able to regroup and attack him. Ralph wraps his arm around Slade's throat and pulls him back. Kyle wrestles his right arm to restrain him while Hawkman jumps to his feet, finally ready for some action. Dr. Light recalls in horror as he realizes that even the best assassin in the world won't save him from the League. Hawkman holds Slade by the throat, Zatanna pulls on his gun strap, Dinah tries to wrestle his hand away from her throat, as Wally and Oliver hold each of his legs to throw him to the ground. The scene eerily resembles something that's happened before, something in Dr. Light's past. And indeed, as this unfolds in reality, Dr. Light remembers the night the League wrestled him to the ground, how they took away his memories, and most of all, his mind. Dr. Light screams with rage as he explodes with a bright flash of light. This blinding explosion knocks out everyone, allowing Deathstroke and Dr. Light to make a quick getaway. When Oliver comes to his senses, he sees Clark already standing there, his arms folded, and he asks them what happened. Deathstroke took our lunch money. We, uh, decided to get it back, jokes Oliver, trying to avoid Clark, but Superman's not that gullible. That's not what I asked. Why didn't you tell us you were going after Dr. Light? Everyone then looks up at Superman, some saddened, some apprehensive, and some of them ashamed. Clark doesn't need his supervision to know that something's wrong. As Oliver and the rest of them try to come up with an excuse, Wally steps in and says, Uh, soups, it was, um, my idea. Ralph had a run-in with Light a few years back, so we thought if this was Light taking revenge, we, uh, we just wanted to give Ralph a chance to bring him in. Oliver is speechless. Despite all the grief he got from Wally earlier, the kid's now taking the fall for them. Clark understands better than anyone. He does understand what Ralph is going through, and so he says nothing. Superman then catches everyone up to date with what Dr. Midnight has uncovered. Ralph's eyes widen with horror as he realizes that it couldn't have been Dr. Light who murdered Sue. As Superman talks to the rest of them, Oliver pulls Wally aside and tries to thank him for taking the fall. But it turns out Wally's still angry with him. What Wally just did was to protect Barry and Hal's name, and not to save Oliver and the rest of them. He still wants answers from Oliver. 
because before the fight started, Oliver had hinted that Dr. Light wasn't the only person whose mind they messed with. He now wants to know who else they've done this to. The truth, Ali, or I swear on Barry's grave I'll hand you over to Clark myself. Oliver stares at Wally in disbelief as blood still drips from his nose and down onto his costume. A few minutes later, Oliver decides to tell him about all the times they decided to wipe memories and alter people's minds. Every time their identity was exposed, especially back when Wizard and his goons had exchanged bodies with the Justice League. Their identities had been exposed and that's exactly what the wizard wanted to capitalize on once he escaped, and this weighed heavily on everyone. Barry had just lost Iris, Dinah had lost her husband Lawrence, and Zatanna had just buried her mother, Cindella. So, the members of the League, Green Arrow, Hawkman, Green Lantern, Flash, Zatanna and Black Canary did what they had to. Ali, you crossed the line, Wally says, but the kid doesn't realize that this was their call. This wasn't for heroes like Superman, Wonder Woman, Aquaman or Batman. They always had to be on the run, on the lookout for the next fight. They never cared for the cleanup. That was up to Oliver and the rest of them. Oliver sighs and continues to tell Wally, Guys like the Wizard or Light or anyone else, they'd love nothing more than to know where our wives, our families sleep. People make fun of our secret identities, wondering how we kept them up for so long. It's because we worked for it. Oliver is getting angrier and angrier by the second. He and the rest of them have had to clean up mess after mess, year after year. He then points at Wally and reminds him about Brainwave, who had learnt Barry's secret identity. It was Oliver and the rest of them who made Brainwave forget, and the case was the same with Dr. Destiny. Oliver and the rest of them are the cleanup crew. Oliver accepts that erasing memories is one thing, but what they did with Dr. Light that night, altering his personality, that's what caused a rift to grow between him and Hawkman. He was the first one to punch Hawkman, and Carter was kind enough to let Oliver have one. Wally realizes that this is the reason Oliver and Carter have been arguing and fighting with each other all these years, and Oliver tries to get Wally to look deeper, look beyond the surface, but it's always been about politics. We see Hawkman pick up his emblem that was attached to the straps of his wings in the background as Wally asks, And you, just, you never told the others? Clark, Bruce, even Arthur? We see Superman consoling Ralph in the background, and this is when Wally gets a glimpse into the politics of the League as Oliver replies, People aren't always stupid, Wally. They believe what they want to believe, and hear what they want to hear. And we see Superman, who's been using his super hearing all along to spy on their conversation. Oliver walks away from Wally, but the kid still doesn't realize that Oliver's last words to him were a jab at Superman. Back at Noah's hideout, he's busy talking to Merlin when he gets a call from Captain Boomerang. Noah decides to take the call, claiming that the captain owes him a favor. Merlin knows why Captain Boomerang owes him a favor. He too has read the Inquisitor which is on the table beside him. The headline reads, Golden Glider and Boomerang had a love child and left him up for adoption. But Merlin knows the captain could never get Golden Glider to sleep with him. Noah picks up Boomerang's call and is awfully nice to him. Too nice. Boomerang sits in his parked car outside a dilapidated house in Central City. We see that Noah sold Boomerang an address, the address to his son's house, the one he abandoned all those years ago. Boomerang slumps over the steering wheel, holding his head. We see he already knows the answer to the request he's going to make, and it's stressing him out big time. Boomerang wants jobs. Any extra jobs that Noah might have, big or small, he doesn't care. He needs the money. But Noah says what Boomerang has been dreading all this while. The captain's neither in his prime, nor is anybody willing to hire him. Boomerang doesn't say anything for a while, and we see Noah may be feeling some pity for him. Noah asks Boomerang to focus on the current task, and says he'll try and get him a job afterward. All you gotta do is go up and say hello. Get one part of your life together. Some adopted kids have a real need to meet the biologicals. Boomerang sighs and stares at the address. Suddenly, the door to the house opens up and we see a young man peek out. He then walks toward the car and Boomerang panics when he sees his son coming towards him. Can I, uh, can I help you? Listen, you shouldn't park here. This is a private property. Boomerang fumbles with his keys, makes an excuse and says he'll be leaving any second now. Satisfied by Boomerang's response, still unaware that it was his father, the young man walks back into his house. Boomerang continues to beg Noah for a job, any job, but Noah knows nobody would hire Boomerang, even if he suggested someone to do so. We now arrive at the Daily Planet's dark room, where Perry White and James Olsen are busy developing the latest photographs from Sue's funeral. Perry is the editor-in-chief at the Daily Planet and James is his star photographer. The two discuss theories about Sue's murder, suspecting that whoever's behind it likely has plans for more. James thinks that whoever's behind the murders is hurting the heroes where it hurts the most, going after everyone's wives. And this thought scares Perry, who speculates that if that is the case, then why would the killer just stop at wives? Why not their families? parents, children. James is clearly shaken up by that thought, just like his boss. We now head to Ivy Town, Jean Loring's apartment, where the talk between James and Perry is seemingly coming true. The framed magazine cover from Jean and Adam's divorce on the wall is broken. The photographs are shattered, and there are holes in the wall. There's coffee spilled on the floor as Jean screams for help. Please, please don't! Ray! Ray! 
Help me! But before she can say any more, she's snatched away and the phone in her hand is thrown against the wall. As she begs for her life, whoever the killer is blindfolds her and then gags her mouth shut. He then puts her in a noose and hangs her by the front door, with the other end of the noose tied to the doorknob on the other side. The killer shuts the door and leaves, hanging Jean from her neck in the process. She writhes around furiously, struggling to breathe, her cries for help muffled and her movements growing frantic by each second, until her feet stop moving and her body goes limp. Jean Loring is no more. Identity Crisis Number 4 – The Truth Jean is hanging by the door, bleeding from her nose and her apartment is in shambles. Broken photos and the remnants of mayhem are sprawled around her as her body hangs limply by the line. Ray shouts her name into the phone, but there's nobody around to answer it. Fearing the worst, and after Sue was murdered three days ago, he can't take any chances. He instantly grows to one twelfth his normal size to ride the phone lines to Jean's place. At this size, he's barely bigger than a proton, but he's grown used to this form of travel. However, today, today, each foot through the phone line seems like a hundred miles for him. When he finally reaches Jean's apartment and jumps out of her phone, he realizes he's already too late when he spots Jean hanging from the door. Without a thought, he jumps toward the rope and tangles himself in its fibers. It's only been 30 seconds since Jean stopped moving, but Ray doesn't know this. He desperately gets himself into each fiber of the rope and grows back up to his normal size. The rope snaps and he catches Jean, but her body doesn't respond. She lies there, still as a rock. Instinctively, Ray decides to perform CPR, but despite being a man of science, he can't help but pray to the gods inside his mind. Jean doesn't respond, and Ray fears the worst. He prays louder and louder, first inside his head, then out loud. And then it happens. Jean violently coughs out her own blood and falls into Ray's arms. As she lies there, barely breathing, she says to her ex-husband, just like the old days. A few hours later, Green Arrow and the rest of his investigative team are busy scanning the apartment for any clues. But just like last time, none of the alarms were triggered. Green Arrow can't believe it. Their super secure security system, the one all League members rely on to protect their loved ones, has just been beaten again twice in the last three days. Mr. Miracle isn't happy either. He's an escape artist, and he's already calculated 17 ways someone can get in and out of the apartment without triggering any alarms. Oliver and Mr. Miracle now fear the worst and consider all possibilities. It could be anyone, a teleporter, a phaser, someone who rides the airwaves, and these 17 ways to enter the apartment don't even account for someone who might have their hands on a mother box. Last time, they had tons of friends, metal men, Atom, and more investigating the crime scene. But this time, things are dire and they need the best, so they brought Superman with them. Clark stands near the door, holding the rope that was used to hang Jean. But Clark doesn't need any detective work to get a lead. All he needs are his Boy Scout skills. He identifies the knot used to hang Jean. It was a bowline knot with a Dutch Marine twist, two things that can narrow down their list of suspects easily. Oracle quickly gets on the search from her headquarters when Mr. Miracle wonders about who it could be. It doesn't necessarily have to be a man. The killer could also be a woman. But that's when Oliver catches him up to what Jean has told them. When Jean entered the apartment, all she was able to see was the killer's shoes. He was already in the apartment, hiding behind the open door, waiting for Jean, anticipating her every move. Jean could only catch a glimpse of his brown work boots before she was blindfolded and hanged from the door. By now, Oracle has completed her search, and she has a suspect for the heroes. It's Christopher West, aka Slipknot. He's Firestorm's former foe, but was hired into the Suicide Squad. He got his arm blown off when he tried to escape, and his specialty is tying knots and hanging people, and his preferred knot, bowline knot with a Dutch Marine twist. When Superman asks for Slipknot's whereabouts, Oracle tells him that he's currently serving 10 years in Opal City Penitentiary. This is all the information they need to know. Clark turns toward Green Arrow and Mr. Miracle and his face looks different. Oliver's never seen Superman this angry in a while, and the rumble in his voice only intensifies things further as he says, I want someone talking to Slipknot. Now! Oliver assures Clark that he's on it immediately, and he knows the best person to take along with him. We now arrive in Opal City's prison outside Slipknot's cell. Oliver's there, and he's eyeing Slipknot, who sits in the shadows. Oliver's known prisoners all his life. Once they're confined, they all turn to religion. Some become devout Christians, others turn to Islam, but what they're really trying to find is redemption, something they all crave. But Slipknot, he's found something far more dangerous. He's joined the cult of Cobra. Slipknot finally sits in the light, flexing his good arm and says, A guess. How sweet. Spare me the fake lisp. Diana, you ready? Oliver isn't wasting any time, which is apparent from who he chose to bring along to the prison, the Amazonian princess herself, daughter of Zeus, Wonder Woman. Diana now comes into view, and Oliver sees that Slipknot is smart. He's already staring at the Lasso of Truth, a weapon created by Zeus that compels anyone to speak nothing but the truth. Slipknot tries to act smart, but his cracking voice is a clear giveaway. He pretends not to be scared by the Lasso, but Oliver knows he's scared. The fake lisp is all but gone from his voice now. Before Slipknot can say more, Diana quickly snaps the Lasso, 
which wraps itself around Slipknot's neck in a second. She then pulls it, smashing Slipknot's face right through the bars. Oliver smiles, bends down and says, she can pull you through those bars, even if you don't fit through them. Diana then speaks, now, what do you know of the attacks on Sue Dibney and Jean Loring? Tears are already streaming down Slipknot's face as he begins spilling out the truth. A few hours later, Green Arrow, Black Canary and The Flash are gathered at the League's headquarters while Clark is on a video call with them from Smallville. He's lifting a large harvester in the air at the farm while his father fixes it. He looks at the screen angrily and screams, What do you mean he didn't know anything? Oliver is the first one to respond. We questioned him for almost an hour, Clark. Believe me, he wasn't holding back. And at the end there, I... I really wish he had. Pa Kent asks his son to put the harvester down, but Clark is too engaged in the conversation. They ask Oracle for their next lead, but things aren't looking good. The first murder looked like it was done by Dr. Light, the second seemingly done by Slipknot, and the only thing those two suspects have in common is the Suicide Squad, which means they have to narrow down a lead from more than 50-plus suspects. Black Canary has the mugshots of each Suicide Squad member sprawled on the table in front of her. Oliver thinks that this connection is too easy, but Superman wants a lead, and this is what they have. Oliver, however, is done following Superman's gut. He knows Clark is scared for Lois, especially after the recent article she wrote, Why We Need Superman. Oliver decides to lay it down on Clark as it is, as he feels it. Sue and Jean may have had public identities, but clearly, this isn't over yet, and it doesn't take a genius to spot the pattern. Clark's calm and subtle everyday nature makes people forget how scary he can be, because one moment he was in Smallville connected to them from a screen, and the moment Oliver has finished speaking, he's right there in front of him, face to face. He even managed to change into his Superman costume for crying out loud. Don't take that tone with me. We're trying our best. But Oliver isn't having it. Soups has dealt with supervillains mostly, but Oliver's the one who's dealt with the lowlifes and criminals more. He knows they're losing this fight. They've been working like amateurs, always a few steps behind the killer. He knows that the other superheroes are beginning to... And when heroes panic, villains swoop in to take advantage of that. We briefly visit Merlin's hideout, where he's joined by the other villains and assassins. Some of them are busy playing a board game while discussing the recent murders while Monocle and Deadshot sit on the porch with their drinks. Merlin and the other assassins want the murderer to be caught soon, so they don't encounter any of the angry heroes, while Deadshot tells Monocle that rumors are going around about Dr. Light, the fact that his memories were wiped and his mind was altered. Things seem to be heating up for our heroes. Back in Central City, it seems Boomerang yet again is trying to get in touch with his estranged son. He sits in his car outside his son's house while talking to Noah, just like before. Noah suddenly asks Boomerang to hang on while he takes another call. Noah is getting a call from the Fiddler, one of Batman's foes. Sadly, the guy can't afford Noah's prices, so Noah has to cut him off pretty soon. It's almost midnight, and Boomerang is tired of waiting in the car for his son. Noah tells Boomerang that his son works in a movie theater, which is why he needs to work late hours. With his head hung low, Boomerang's son comes into view, and he notices his father's car again. And although Boomerang tries to hide by lowering his body, his son has already spotted him. He approaches the car and rests his arm on the window while staring at Boomerang. You're Captain Boomerang, aren't you? Are you my dad? Boomerang's surprised. He can't believe his ears. How does he know that? How does the boy know that Boomerang is his father? His mind races with tons of thoughts, and the aging villain decides to ask his son, Owen. Owen tells his father that tabloid reporters have been following him around all week. It wasn't exactly hard for him to put two and two together and guess that he was Boomerang's son. And when one reporter tossed a boomerang at him, his suspicions were confirmed. And following in his father's footsteps, Owen did what his father would do. He tossed the boomerang right back at the reporter, slicing his earlobe off in the process. Owen smirks, and no doubt the aging villain is proud of him. Boomerang apologizes to Owen for abandoning him, but Owen's cool with it. His adoptive parents have been decent, but they're not as interesting as his biological father. So you're, uh, good with a boomerang? Asks Owen, and boomerang nods. I, uh, I guess there's not much you can do with it. And this makes Boomerang smile with glee. He can't wait to show his son what can be accomplished simply by using a Boomerang. We now arrive at the Batcave, the gloomy and dimly lit headquarters of Batman. Alfred holds an ornate tray with a drink for Bruce as he makes his way deeper into the cave. Batman's busy investigating the murders when Alfred grabs his attention by saying that he got a call from Clark. Alfred tells the Bat that the League will now be investigating the Suicide Squad members. Batman turns around in his chair and says, it's not the squad, Alfred. The squad doesn't benefit. There's no gain. Batman slams his hand on the table in front of him where we see he has the photos of all the suspects lined up. Batman knows he needs to find out who benefits from these murders. Who benefits by murdering Sue and Jean. It's the first rule of solving crime. And as the Bat contemplates this from his cave, we see the benefits everyone is gaining from these murders. Firstly, it's Captain Boomerang, who smiles at his son sitting beside him in the car as it speeds down the road. 
The tabloids got a whiff of his affair, which eventually proved beneficial for Boomerang. He's now reunited with his son. Next is Noah, who's been selling information to villains day and night thanks to the panic caused by these murders. He's now on a call with the Fiddler, who's now ready to pay his asking price of $3,000. After that, we head to Ralph's house, the first victim of these murders, Sue's husband. He sprawled on the couch with his head between his arms. He's gotten a call from the insurance agent informing him of Sue's insurance policy. Her family had quite a significant one which will result in a huge payout. Could Ralph be behind all this just to get an insurance payout? We see Merlin back at his hideout, painting his minifigures of Civil War soldiers as usual. The business has been booming for the assassin as more and more villains hire protection, outsource jobs and form contingency plans. He gets a call from Noah who says, Merlin, one to make a quick three grand? There it is, another job, likely the one from Fiddler. Is Merlin behind the murders? Next, we travel back to Gotham City, where Tim Drake is calling in sick for tonight's patrol. Since the murders, he's gotten to spend more time with his father, and their relationship has improved considerably. He's also worried about his father. It's the only family he has now after his mother's death, and he could be the next prime target of the murderer. We now catch up with Oliver in a cemetery. Oliver hates cemeteries, but he hates this one the most. It houses Hal's grave. He and Hal, the previous Green Lantern, and just before his death, the Spectre were best friends. Oliver walks and stands over Hal's grave and suddenly with a loud hiss and a cloud of smoke, Hal appears before him. What do you want, Oliver? Hal asks, his voice low and his arms crossed across his chest. Oliver sighs. Hal is already in a bad mood and what Oliver has come to say is only going to make things worse. Uh, by the way, can you lose the costume now? You know it creeps me out. Oliver tries to make Hal's mood a little better with this joke and his friend smiles and complies. Hal now appears before Oliver in his signature bomber jacket and Oliver can't help but make fun of his friend's dated style. The two smirk at each other, and then Oliver puts his arm around his friend. He's missed him too much. The two make small talk for a while until Hal finally asks the reason for Oliver's visit. The Green Arrow sighs and tells him about Sue's death and the attempted murder of Jean's life. You know who did it, don't you? Oliver asks, and Hal can't meet his eyes. Hal does know who did it, but he can't tell Oliver. Oliver doesn't care that Hal can't tell him. He wants to know why Hal isn't doing his job, why the Spectre isn't punishing the guilty. You don't understand. I report to a higher power. But before he can finish his sentence, Hal is cut off by Oliver. I don't care who the hell you work for. Our friend is dead. They killed her, burned half her face off, and left her lying there like a doormat. You know who did it. How can you not punish them? Hal looks at him with pity and a hint of sympathy. He tells Oliver that as the Spectre, he doesn't punish every murderer or smother every child killer. Even if Hal wanted to do that, it doesn't work that way. It's not up to Hal who the Spectre kills. Oliver slumps back down onto Hal's grave. He's silent for a while, but then he finally asks, can you at least tell me who did it? Hal sighs. There's pain in his voice. He tells his friend again that he can't tell him who did it. It doesn't work that way. He looks up toward the sky, wishing he could, but then comes back to reality and takes a seat beside his friend. Do me a favor, Ollie. Make them pay when you find them. Oliver looks up at the sky and asks, So, Hal, when are you coming back? Hal doesn't understand Oliver's question, but Oliver says, Yeah, you do. We've been at this too long. He then turns his head towards him and asks his friend again, When are you really coming back? Hal smiles mischievously and says, mm, I'm working on it. The writers broke the fourth wall here, making Oliver and Hal self-aware. This page, with just three panels, is hinting at Hal Jordan's return in Green Lantern Rebirth comic book series that'll be released the same year as this comic, 2004. We now travel to Metropolis, at the Daily Planet office, where Clark's soulmate, Lois Lane, is busy worrying about him. She knows her Clark too well for her own good. Despite the brave face and the facade that he puts up, she knows Clark's been on the edge for the past three days. He's visited his parents every day to ensure their safety. He keeps cracking his middle knuckle, and Lois even caught him analyzing and investigating their marriage album, using his X-ray vision trying to be subtle. And while all this races through her mind, Lois is busy going around the office doing her daily work. She even runs into a co-worker who can't believe the headlines the Daily Star their rival has published. Loring attacked. Who's next? The paper even claims to have pictures inside, but it's only Jean's photo from her book's cover. Lois then goes back to her cubicle, where she finds a private letter addressed to her. This is ominous and quite unexpected as Lois wasn't expecting any letter. She looks around to ensure nobody's looking, tears the envelope, and finally opens the letter. Her eyes widen with surprise and shock as she reads the words written in it, Lois, I know who your husband is. You're next. The S in the word husband is a crude replica of Superman's insignia, and things just got a whole lot worse for the League. Identity Crisis Number 5 – Father's Day The Justice League was kicked into gear when Lois received a death threat. Something that Oliver had warned Superman about has now come to fruition. This has caused them to target every threat and every suspect simultaneously. No more murders, no more pain, no more death. Not anymore. Oliver races toward the front door of Merlin's hideout and kicks it in. He rushes in with his bow drawn, but he's soon greeted by Merlin standing guard. And he's not alone. Monocle covers his left flank while Deadshot covers the right. But before they can attack, the wall behind 
them cracks and then begins to shake. The next moment it gives way and the rest of Oliver's squad flies in. Green Lantern, The Flash and Hawkman. The time to be a few steps behind is long gone and we see that the League has planned this attack down to every last detail. They know Monocle's entire power comes from his eyepiece, which is why Hawkman targets it first. Next it's time for Merlin and the man is faster than Oliver had expected. He's managed to draw a bow from his quiver. But that's why Oliver isn't going to take him on. The fastest man on earth is. Before Merlin can even react, the Flash has removed his quiver and broken off the bow that he'd managed to draw and point at Oliver. As for Deadshot, he can be lethal, which is why Kyle's going after him. Before the assassin can react and aim for Green Lantern, Kyle has him already trapped in a bulletproof box. Wondering if it's bulletproof? Huh, <laughs> take a shot. Ricochets never miss. But this is when Kyle makes a mistake. Deadshot does indeed shoot, but the bullet ricochets and hits him directly in the neck. In a state of panic, Kyle dematerializes the box, but that's exactly what Deadshot was counting on. He aims directly for Kyle's face and fires away. His friend Wally rushes over to Kyle while Deadshot tries to make his escape. Kyle will be fine, but he can't see for the moment. Oliver, though, has come prepared this time. He knows Deadshot will chew off his own foot if that means he can get away, which is why Green Arrow has a backup for such situations. It's the Man of Steel himself, Superman. Clark grabs Deadshot by the throat and his face is seething with anger. Nobody threatens Lois and gets away so easily. And if it indeed was Deadshot, then even God might not be able to save him from Clark's fury. Oliver then puts the sharpened end of his bow against Merlin's throat and the interrogation is now underway. It's not the Justice League that has sprung into action. Everyone has. We see the Titans take down Warp. The Outsiders take down the Black Spider. The Justice League reserves have sprung into action and have taken down Heat Wave, while the Justice Society of America has taken down Mirror Master. But not all interrogations go as planned. When Shazam's team is trying to capture Shadow Thief, things get out of hand rather quickly. Despite the team's best efforts, Shadow Thief manages to steal Shining Knight Sword and stab Firestorm directly in the chest. He manages to escape as the team is too focused on what's just happened. Firestorm knows that this is the end for him, and the team does too. It's not rocket science. Everyone knows what happens when you puncture a nuclear reactor. Shazam hates to say it, but he asks Firestorm to fly as high as he can to avoid the explosion from targeting any civilians. Someone say goodbye to my dad for me. A Firestorm's last words before he bursts into a huge explosion high up in the atmosphere. Oliver hates himself for giving the youngster grief when he was alive. He was always a pro at his job, but Oliver will never get the chance to tell him that now. Back at Jean Loring's apartment, Adam stands beside the telephone in his costume, ready to leave. Jean lies on the bed rather seductively, and we learn that Ray has brought her home from the hospital, talked to the doctors about all the precautions, and even got Jean's favorite by how tea. Clearly, the uh, spark seems to be reigniting between the divorced couple. Jean wants him to leave and do his job help the Justice League. She's fine now and can take care of herself, but Ray used to be her husband. He knows her better than anyone else. He knows why she falters as she tries to scratch her neck. It's still sore and painful, but she doesn't want Ray to find out. But Ray already knows. He grows back to his normal size and is no longer in his costume. He holds both of Jean's hands and it's clear that he's about to get mushy. Jean doesn't like mushy, but there's no stopping Ray. He tells her that he's glad that she's okay, especially after everything that's happened in the past few days. Just give me a hug. I gotta go meet Carter. The League wants me to try Trace the calculator through the phone lines. Jean chuckles at the name as she rests her head on Ray's shoulder, and the two hug, and Ray tells her that the calculator is a serious threat. He's the villain's oracle minus the moral. Jean lifts her head and whispers in Ray's ear, By the way, when you uh, pulled me out of that noose, I heard you pray for me. Ray blushes but doesn't act on his instinct and Jean has to tell him that this is the point where he's supposed to kiss her. The two lock in an embrace and kiss, their lost love seemingly reignited. Back in Central City, Owen and Boomerang are busy having some father and son time together. Boomerang's teaching his son how to throw boomerangs while showing him the various different ones he's used over the years. Right now, he shows him his explosive boomerang, the one that almost managed to rip out Barry's arm. Owen grabs it and gives it a swing, which which lodges it in a tree. Seconds later, the boomerang explodes and the entire tree is blown away. After the demonstration, the two of them decide to play catch. We see Captain Boomerang on the other end, catching all the boomerangs Owen throws. At Owen's feet is a duffel bag full of different boomerangs. He's teaching Owen how to throw boomerangs and wants him to throw it overhead, like a baseball. If he continues tossing them the way he's currently doing, then it'll either return to Owen, or worse, hit Captain Boomerang in the chest when it comes down. Owen chooses his next boomerang, the razor-sharp one, and gives it a swing. The throw is perfect. But sadly for Captain Boomerang, it's too perfect, too fast. The Boomerang is headed straight for his head, and he barely has any time to react. Owen screams for his dad in horror as he realizes what's about to happen. Not even a day has passed since he met his biological father, 
and it seems he's already about to lose him. Instinctively, he rushes toward Captain Boomerang, and to his and his dad's surprise, Owen is really fast, but enough to pull his father out of the way before it strikes the tree behind him. Owen seemingly has super speed. Boomerang asks his son how he did that, but Owen has no idea. The two of them look behind them and spot the trail of dirt Owen created, a byproduct of his super speed. Owen looks horrified as he tries to figure out what just happened. He then puts two and two together and says, Golden Glider isn't my mother, is she? Boomerang stares at his son for a second, looks away, and then confirms his suspicion. Golden Glider isn't Owen's mum. Let's now move to Gotham City and check in on Tim and his father. Tim is decked up in his Robin costume, ready for tonight's patrol. He spent the past week staying home since Sue was murdered, partly worried for his dad while partly enjoying his company, but now that Lois has been threatened, Robin needs to go out there and find the killer before they target another one of the League's members. His dad, however, is on the fence. Jack's been watching the news all day and night ever since he learned about his son's nightly escapades, and this obsession with the news has only grown over the past week since Sue was murdered. Although he's been having a rough time, Jack is, after all, Tim's father, and putting two and two together this time wasn't a big deal for him. When Batman insisted Robin join him on tonight's patrol, Jack figured that things might have ramped up, that someone might have been threatened, prompting the heroes to amp up their search. He wants to know who was threatened, but Robin can't tell him that. His dad might know his secret identity, but the boy wonder isn't going to snitch out one of his fellow heroes, especially Superman. Robin finishes this conversation with his dad and is about to leave when his dad calls him again, asking him to wait. Jack, despite his best efforts, can't let his son leave, not when he knows that Tim is intentionally putting himself in harm's way each night. His pleas come off as emotional blackmailing, as Jack says, You know, I've, uh, I've probably be good about this. Yeah, better than most parents, in fact. Better than any parent. I mean, my uh, therapy bills alone, I... I just worry about you, Tim. Maybe it'd be better if you stayed in tonight. I mean, you're uh, 16 years old. You shouldn't be running around in a mask and a cape. Tim buries his face in his hand as he sits on the windowsill. Not this again. He's heard this same speech. These same words from his dad every time he's gone out for patrol. Every night since revealing his identity to him. Robin takes a long, deep breath and then stares at his dad and tells him that it's too late for him to not be Robin, to not use his skills to help the world. He tells his dad that he worries about him too, which is why he was staying home all these days, protecting him in case something happens. But with the murders and threats growing, the only way to protect his loved ones and keep them safe is by capturing the killer. Jack stares at his son and then at the Robin symbol on his chest, and he finally realizes that he shouldn't hold Tim back. Robin asks his dad to take care and use the signal device in case anything remotely threatening happens, and Jack nuts. Robin leaps out of the window, and once he's gone, we hear Jack say, I'm proud of you, son. Jack's smile instantly fades away as he walks out of Tim's room and closes the door. He makes his way to the kitchen with his head hung low when he spots a mysterious box with a note placed atop the kitchen counter. He walks up to it and opens the note, which reads, Jack Drake. The R in his last name is written in red and circled just like the threatening letter Lois received. But Jack doesn't know this yet, so he hesitantly opens the box. Inside is another note that says, Protect yourself. And along with it is a loaded handgun. Jack instantly slumps to the floor in terror and hits the single button on his Justice League signal device. Seconds later, he's in contact with the Oracle and Jack says, I'm looking for Robin. I, I, I think my life might be in danger. As he says this into his signal device, Device, we see a dark figure spying on him from just outside his window. The mysterious person's phone buzzes, and they pick it up quickly, asking the person on the other end to call after some time. Jack seems to feel the presence outside his window, but the mysterious person quickly climbs on the roof before Jack can turn around. Panic sets in as Jack realizes someone might be outside. He tells the Oracle that he was sent a gun by someone, and the Oracle replies, Stay where you are, Mr. Drake. I'm calling him right now. Jack thinks that he can handle it, but when he hears the mystery person land on his roof, all hell breaks loose. Something just crashed on my roof. Whoever it is, you tell the police I'm shooting if he comes inside. The panic is taking over Jack, and Oracle can't let that happen. I'm getting your son now, Mr. Drake. Stay calm. But Jack's mind is working overtime. Overthinking and overimagining as fear, terror, and dread takes over his logical thinking. He's on my roof. You're my witness. I'm just defending myself. Oracle feels Jack slip away from her grip as she tries to bring him back to his senses. Just stay away from the windows, Mr. Drake. Tim is with Batman, and the two of them are patrolling the streets of Gotham in the Batmobile when Barbara contacts Tim and tells him to get home as fast as he can. What are you talking about? What's wrong? Oracle then breaks it to him that his father's in trouble. Batman grimaces and quickly makes a U-turn on the narrow streets of Gotham with a loud scream. Back at Tim's house, we see the mystery man enter the building through the restricted roof entrance. In the apartment, Jack is anticipating the worst. He has the gun drawn and is hiding behind the sofa with eyes locked on the front door. The Oracle tells him that she's managed to contact Tim, but Jack's still spiraling. Listen to me. If something happens, tell him I love him. Understand? Make sure he hears that. The Oracle knows this is bad, and she patches Robin through to him. Tim is terrified, and he shakily calls out to his dad over the comms. The red light from the interior console of the Batmobile over Tim's face only exaggerates his feelings further. I, I, I'm fine. 
I think he is in the hallway. I've got it though. I'm fine. I'm fine. Tim can't believe his father's words. Dad, this isn't some African safari. Get out of there. Jack, however, is focused on the mystery man. His footsteps get louder with each passing second, confirming Jack's suspicions. He's definitely in the hallway, and Jack, in his deliriousness, thinks he's ready. He raises the gun, ready to shoot at whoever walks in. That man knows this isn't good, and they won't manage to reach there on time. He wants the Oracle to call Wally, but she's already tried it. Wally isn't picking up, which is why it's up to them. We see the mystery man by now has reached the front door of Tim's apartment, and in the car, Tim is only panicking further. Bruce, please, please help him. Hope and desperation drips from Tim's voice, and for a second, it scares the bat. The kid's already lost his mother for what he turned him into. Bruce can't let him lose his father as well. Batman speeds up the Batmobile, determined to reach the apartment before anything bad happens. Jack continues to panic as he realizes Batman is also on the call. Just keep my boy safe. Please, keep him safe. Batman can't believe what he's hearing. Not again. He growls and pushes the Batmobile to its limits. The next minute is spent in sheer panic in the apartment and in the Batmobile. Jack feels his time has come, and so he has to say his last words to Tim. And as Jack begins to speak, we see someone else. Someone unknown to us listen to a message waiting for them on the answering machine, and Jack tells his son how much he loves him, how much he means to Jack, that as a father, he couldn't be more proud of what Tim does, using his talent and skills to save people each and every night. So does the other message resemble the same sentiment. The other dad tells his son something big is gonna happen tonight, something that puts them back in the big leagues. And so he asks his son to watch the news tonight, He'll be leaving a calling card for his son that he'd be able to spot easily. Simultaneously, Jack pressures Tim to not blame himself if he doesn't reach the apartment in time. I love you, just like your mother loves you. Tell Bruce to take care of you and never question what you do, ever. Tim begins to cry in the Batmobile, fearing the worst, when suddenly there's a loud bang and both the sons scream, Dad! It's revealed that the other person listening to the answering machine was none other than Owen, Boomerang's son. And barging into Tim's apartment is none other than Captain Boomerang himself. Sweat beads up on Jack's forehead as he holds the gun close to his chest, finding cover beside the kitchen wall. Boomerang turns toward the kitchen, but before he can even react, Jack opens fire. Bang, bang, bang! Three shots, right in Boomerang's chest. But the aging villain isn't going down without a fight. He had the razor Boomerang in his hand, which he swings towards Tim's father. The Boomerang lodges itself right where Jack's heart should be. The two fathers lie, motionless, opposite to each other as blood slowly begins to pool around them. Identity Crisis Number 6, Dead End Robin screams for his dad as he rushes up the stairs of his apartment building. The Oracle wants him to remember that if the police are there, his secret identity might be at risk as he's in his Robin costume. But Tim isn't thinking. Although he manages to lose his costume while rushing toward the apartment, he forgets to stash it away and leaves everything strewn all over the stairs. He reaches the smashed-in front door, and the first thing he spots is a trail of blood. His eyes widen in shock as Oracle desperately tries to help. Tim, you have to understand there's nothing any of us could do. But Barbara's words fall on deaf ears. Tim is looking at his father's dead body, lying on the kitchen floor in a pool of his own blood. Tim doesn't even feel for a pulse. He's been trained well. He knows the outcome of an injury like that. But despite that, despite knowing it's the wrong move to leave your prince on the murder weapon, Tim reaches out and tries to pull the boomerang lodged in his father's ribs. Get it out. Get it out. Get it out. Please. 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 Tears have been streaming down his face all this while. And his desperation has turned to frustration. His anger to sorrow. Batman approaches from behind, his arm extended as he tries to console his younger princess. Tim turns around and he can barely hold his face together, let alone stop the tears. Bruce wraps his arms around him and holds him tightly close to his chest. Tim's eyes still wide with shock as he realizes he doesn't have a father anymore. Batman continues to hold him close, wrapping his cape around the boy. I've got you. And it's one of those rare times when Bruce lets his emotions seep through his suit and into the outside world. Batman and Robin, now, both are orphans. Owen's watching the news nervously just like his father asked when he hears the reporter say, In what police are calling a botched robbery, the body of Captain Boomerang has been... It's all the youngster needs to hear. And before the reporter can even finish reporting, he's already reached the crime scene and has ripped the police tape in an attempt to get inside. He's, however, soon stopped by a man in a suit, someone who seems to be from another agency and not the police. Owen tells the man that Captain Boomerang is his father and he needs to see the body, but the man can't allow that. No civilians are allowed on the crime scene especially ones related to supervillains. The man in the suit can't have Owen bringing his father back to life. Not again. Not in Gotham. Owen then spots Batman in the apartment building and screams, What's he doing here? I don't know what you're talking about. The man in the suit clearly sees the bat, but no way is he acknowledging his presence, especially to a civilian. Owen continues to poke and prod, forcing the man to adjust his glasses and pull the young man aside. Son, don't pick a fight. Not here. Take it from me. The best you can do now is go home. Take some time. 
and be thankful you had the time together that you did. At the Justice League headquarters, Dr. Midnight and Mr. Terrific are busy carrying out Sue's autopsy. It's been a few days and Sue's body has begun to show signs of decomposition. By ruling out carbon monoxide poisoning, they're now posed with a bigger question. How did Sue actually die? How did Boomerang kill her? And so far, they haven't found any answers. Dr. Midnight had Dr. Fate come in and rule out magic as a cause of death. He even has Star Labs preparing the toxicology report for Sue. He even plans on calling the Ray in to perform a spectrum analysis of Sue's organs. But all of this is too much to do, and they don't have much time on their hands. Sue's body is decomposing rapidly. Back in Star City, Oliver is reading the Daily Planet while sipping on his coffee. Jack Drake's memoriam is front and center on the first page. In the background, his son's already in his costume ready for their sparring session. But something is eating at Oliver's mind. Something that's just happened to Tim. He looks toward his son and says that they won't be sparring today. He then pulls his son in for a hug, telling him that he loves him. We see that another death, Jack's death is not only playing on the League's mind, but is also making them more fearful for their loved ones, for the lives of their loved ones. They're remembering their deceased loved ones, their deceased children, sisters, wives, husbands, mothers, and of course, fathers. Through each of these panels, we see how the role that Alfred took on in Bruce's life when his parents died, was taken on by Bruce in Dick's life, and is now again being taken on by Bruce in Tim's life. We see Owen at his father's grave with today's newspaper held up to the gravestone. Front page, Dad, just like you wanted. His eyes tear up as he says these words. Oliver believes that the only good thing to come out of this is Boomerang's death. Although they don't know how he found out their real identities, he's glad that he took that knowledge to the grave with him. We see Clark meet with Lois back in their home. Superman is finally relieved that the murder spree has ended. Meanwhile, things continue to go back to normal. Marilyn and the gang, along with Monocle, are freed by the government partly due to their involvement in the Suicide Squad, partly due to a loosely prepared case by the defense. And now that Dr. Light remembers what he was meant to forget, he's busy hatching his own devious plan to get back at the League for what they did to him. He sits in his chair menacingly as he hatches his devious revenge. Captain Boomerang's mantle is now being taken over by Owen, his son. He adorns a similar costume to his father, with the addition of his scarf. He's going to prove to be deadlier than his father, as his super speed will allow him to chuck boomerangs at incredible speeds. Back in Star City, Oliver is facing off against Deathstroke on a rooftop. The confrontation is quite a short one, as Deathstroke has other plans. Oliver performs a sideways somersault and shoots his arrow at Deathstroke, but the master assassin is long gone. Where Oliver's arrow struck the wall is Deathstroke's mask, the one Oliver tore off in their previous fight, along with the note that reads, This is yours. We're not done. Oliver walks up to the mask and grabs it, pondering and wondering what's about to happen next. Wally soon arrives after having searched the block for any signs of Deathstroke. He's found nothing. He spots the mask in Oliver's hand and grabs it from him. Oliver asks Wally about Boomerang, and the young Flash informs him that Boomerang's body is being buried in an unmarked grave by the government. The Rogues, a group of supervillains the Flash is well versed with, plan to hold a funeral for him. Oliver grimaces. He can't believe that Captain Boomerang of all people was the reason for their panic, for Sue's death. But it happened. Not only did he have the League panicking, but he really gave them a run for their money, even more than Dr. Light and Deathstroke. Wally agrees with Oliver and hangs his head low. Oliver stares at him and smiles. The Green Arrow knows the kid is lying. He's a worse liar than his Uncle Barry, Oliver's close friend. What are you really here for, Wally? It's then that Wally finally opens up to Oliver. We learn that Wally's been hiding something from the League all this while. The day they fought Dr. Light and Deathstroke, Light's memories came flooding back to him. When this happened, Wally could also see the memories in his brain. It was as though he was watching a movie. And that's when he noticed something. When Oliver had first recounted the story to him and Kyle, Oliver had said that there were seven of them on the satellite, holding Dr. Light as he went berserk. But in Dr. Light's memories, there were eight of them, including Batman. How come he didn't mention Batman the first time? Oliver holds his breath. He avoids eye contact with Wally at all costs as he fiddles with his bow nervously. Wally lets Oliver do his thing for a minute, but when it becomes clear that Oliver isn't going to answer, Wally asks again. What? He was there, wasn't he? Oliver continues looking down at his bow, ignoring Wally's questions. Wally asks Oliver again, but the Green Arrow continues to be silent. In a fit of anger, Wally decides to walk away. Fine, be stubborn. I'll just call Bruce. And that's when Oliver breaks his silence. Wally, when Dr. Light attacked Sue, we may have voted to wipe his mind, but that wasn't the only vote we took that night. Wally's face reflects utter shock and disbelief as he realizes the implications of what Oliver's saying. They wiped Bruce's memories. But before Wally can go off the rails and assume the worst, Oliver interrupts him and tells him that they had to do it. Wally still doesn't understand. What could have been so dire that they had to wipe Bruce's memories? Oliver then begins to recount the rest of the events of the night, which begins another flashback. We see Bruce leaving the satellite via a teleporter as the others apprehend Light, while Ralph takes Sue to the hospital in the background. And although Bruce and Clark always left the clean-up to them, that night was different. 
That night, it was Sue who was affected, and so Bruce came back. When Bruce arrives through the teleporter, we see that Zatanna is already trying to alter Dr. Light's mind. Seeing this, Bruce growls with rage, demanding answers. And although Zatanna tries to explain herself, Bruce is going insane with rage. He screams at them to get off Dr. Light as he charges toward them with his batarang drawn. Before Bruce can do anything, Zatanna uses her magic to pause him where he is while Carter carries Dr. Light away. And when Zatanna pauses Batman in space and time, everybody panics. Black Canary begins shedding tears as she realizes what they've done and what this'll lead up to. Hal and Oliver want them to release Bruce immediately, although Hal is the only level-headed one among them. Carter convinces them to erase Batman's memories, just the past 10 minutes to keep the League together. They'd seen Bruce angry in the past, but this amount of rage, and that too, directed at them. It'll not only tear the League apart, but might even lead to some dire, unintended consequences. That's the reason they all voted again that night, to decide whether they should wipe Bruce's memories or not. Wally can't believe what Oliver is saying. How could they do that? That's when Oliver recounts punching Carter across the face. They didn't arrive at that conclusion so easily that night. It took a punch, a rift of 20 years that still continues between Carter and Oliver. You still walked away, Oliver. You let them do it. This is Batman we're talking about. You can't do that to Batman. Oliver is growing wary of Wally. The kid's still unable to see the truth that in some battles, both the sides lose. What do you think, Wally? You think he hasn't done the same to us? Wally stares at Oliver for a second and then says, He'd never do that. After hearing this, Oliver has had enough. Wally can believe whatever he wants. You're telling me, Oliver, that I'm wrong? And that's it. This is when Oliver breaks and lets loose. He calls Wally a kid and asks him to ponder upon what he's learned so far. Everything they've done, everything each one of them has done, everything even Wally has done to keep their identity safe. That each one of them hasn't done it for selfish reasons. It's to protect the ones they love, their families, wives, and children. Oliver removes and waves his mask at Wally. There are animals out there, and when it comes to family, we can't always be there to protect them, but the mask will. Wally sighs and says, So that's it then. Bruce still has no idea. Oliver shakes his head. He's gonna have to spell it out for the kid. The man's a detective for crying out loud. He always has an idea. And Oliver's right. Bruce is a detective. A detective that's currently investigating the murder of Jack Drake. He clutches the note he found in Tim's apartment. Protect yourself. Batman's going after Noah, formerly known as the supervillain Calculator. He's tracked the note back to Noah, who seemingly lounges in his hideout, computers all around him, and no clue that the Bat is coming for him. He's talking to Merlin, who recently got out of jail scot-free, thanks to Lex Luthor and Deadshot's connections with the Suicide Squad. Batman approaches the front door to Noah's hideout as Merlin asks him about Boomerang's murder. Noah tells Merlin that he got him the job, but he didn't have anything to do with Boomerang's murder. Wait, so you're telling me, Noah, you weren't the one who sent Jack Drake the gun? Noah shakes his head. He too has been trying to find out who sent the gun. By now, Batman has entered Noah's hideout, but is nowhere to be found. Turns out Noah has shifted to a new place and has left Batman a goodbye note as well. He watches Batman in his old hideout on a monitor as he continues telling Merlin everything about Boomerang's murder. The source wanted someone cheap, which is why Noah got Boomerang the job, especially after the aging villain had been requesting him for one over the past few days. Batman picks up the note in Noah's old hideout, which reads, Bats, we're not all morons. Batman looks toward the camera in the abandoned warehouse and we see Noah smiling in his chair, giggling loudly watching the monitor with Batman on it. Back at the League headquarters, Dr. Midnight is busy with his autopsy. He's looking into a microscope when he suddenly spots something interesting. Michael! Michael! He screams, calling for Mr. Terrific. Seems like the doctor has finally found something. Simultaneously in the Batcave, Batman's busy going over the clues again. He needs to start from the beginning. Sue's body was burned after her death to cover something up. He's checked for possible ways of entering the apartment, has accounted for teleporters, and has even called in help to find if there were any traces of magic. Rooms of the League members are practically airtight. Even the air pressure is controlled. We've locked down everything, down to the last. Molecule. Batman's eyes widen with shock and horror as he says the last word. Molecule. The world's greatest detective has finally solved it. Back in the League headquarters, where Sue's autopsy is going on, Dr. Midnight showing Mr. Terrific what he's found on the big screen. Dr. Midnight had been analyzing Sue's brain, a magnified part of which is now being shown on the big screen. He'd specifically been studying the mid-medulla, and the tissue sample on the screen is mostly pink with tiny specks of black in a small portion. Mr. Terrific doesn't understand what they're supposed to be, but Dr. Midnight does. These are tiny breakages around the nuclei. Sue had a blockage in the bloodstream in that part of the brain which cut off the blood supply to her brain, which in turn led to her death. They finally figured out the cause of Sue's death a blockage in the brain. Mr. Terrific is more confused than ever. 
How can a villain, or for that matter, anyone engineer a blockage in someone's brain? That's when Dr. Midnight shows him the real clue he found when magnifying further to look at the tissue more closely. He puts what he's seeing on the big screen for Mr. Terrific and asks him to look closely. Soon, Mr. Terrific spots tiny indentations near the black blockages, and upon a closer look, they resemble human footprints. Dr. Midnight says, Footprints. That's what caused the block in her bloodstream, and that's what killed Sue Dibney. Someone was standing there. Mr. Terrific's face slowly goes from feelings of surprise and confusion to panic as he realizes what this means. It was a microscopic assassination, and the only person that can shrink down that small is Atom himself. Back in the Batcave, Batman has sprung into action. He came to the same conclusion moments ago when pondering over the clues of the murder. He calls in Martian Manhunter and asks him to locate Ray Palmer as soon as possible. Martian Manhunter is confused, so he uses his powers to probe Batman's mind to find out what's happened. John, get out of my head. Just find him. Now, and keep him where he is, screams Batman as he gets ready to leave the Batcave. Meanwhile, Dr. Midnight and Mr. Terrific are trying to reach Ray themselves, but he isn't responding and so they decide to call and inform the Justice League Watchtower. Back in Ivy Town at Jean's apartment, we see Ray brushing his teeth and Jean reading the newspaper in bed. Their relationship is clearly taking off as the two seem to have spent the night together. As Jean continues reading the news, she talks to Ray about Boomerang being the one who killed Sue. I mean, that's who killed Sue? That's who attacked me? Captain Boomerang? Ray, however, doesn't care. The man is clearly smitten in love and he's just glad that everything is over. He climbs into the bed and caresses Jean's cheek as he turns off the light. Identity Crisis Number 7 – Truth and Consequences the news of the new finding, that the Atom might have murdered Sue Dibney, is spreading around like wildfire. The Martian Manhunter can't believe what he saw when he probed Batman's mind, nor does Wildcat when Mr. Terrific and Dr. Midnight share their findings with him. Meanwhile, unaware of what's transpiring outside his personal life, Ray is busy enjoying all the time he can get with his ex-wife, Jean Loring. It's good to have you back, Jean. It's good to have you safe. Jean and Ray have been having their intimate moments for a while, when out of the blue, she decides to ask Ray about the note found when Jack Drake was murdered. Was the League ever able to figure out who wrote it? Ray begins to tell her that the League is still working on it, when suddenly everything clicks for him. His face goes from love to disgust and anger within a second as he double takes at his wife. With a stern face, he gets off of the bed, turns on the light and asks Jean how she knows about the note. Jean tells him that the papers wrote about the note, and that's when everything unravels for Ray. He knows the papers don't know about the note. Nobody does. Batman took the note for himself, for his own investigation. Jean tries to deny and act indifferent about it, but Ray has had enough and he screams, How did you know that there was a note, Jean? Jean tries to ask Ray what he's implying. And that's when Ray figures out the entire truth. His eyes widen with shock and horror. Oh my god, did you send that note and gun? Jean tries to calm him down, but Ray wants answers and he wants them now. When Jean tries to calm him down again, Ray screams at the top of his lungs, Answer me! Jean recalls in horror as she's never seen Ray this angry. Are you crazy? Of course not. Ray stares at his ex-wife in silence. There's not a hint of deceit on her face, but Ray knows her better than anyone. There's a reason he divorced her. You found my old costumes in the basement, didn't you? And this forces Jean to remember the day she found his old costumes. By now, Ray has pieced everything together for himself. There was no sign of the murderer because it was committed on a microscopic level. Please tell me it didn't kill Sue. But Jean simply looks at him, stares into his eyes, and finally tears up. Hey, I, I, I didn't, I didn't mean to. Jean lies on the bed trying to act innocent, claiming that she missed Ray. She missed Ray a lot. She didn't want to kill Sue, she just wanted to knock her out, to scare everyone as a prank. I figured when word got out, Ralph would come running, and Clark would race to Lois, and maybe if I was lucky, I, I know it sounds childish. You thought I'd come running back to you, asks Ray, and with a maniacal laugh, Jean agrees, because Ray did indeed come running back to her. Although she was worried that they wouldn't have a spark, she was clearly mistaken. Ray can see through her words, through her laugh. All she cares about is herself, what she wants. She has no remorse for killing their friend's wife, Sue. No remorse for orphaning Tim. No remorse for getting another man killed just to maintain her innocence. Jean's mania continues as she exclaims that their time together was just like the old days. Oh God, you're insane. But Jean is lost in her world, hoping that Ray will see her perspective. How it was all just an accident. She tells him that she practiced and practiced to prepare for the trip, but it can be disorienting and of course Ray knows that. Ray can relate to her, can't he? In the flashback, we see Jean enter Sue's apartment through the phone and go in her ear. When she comes out, Sue is already convulsing down on the floor. Throughout all this, her voice is patronizing, 
dripping with fake innocence. I shrunk some other weapons just in case, and, and in the panic I just… I didn't want to go to jail. And we see Jean get ready to burn off Sue's face as she wishes her goodbye. Ray sits on the bed with his head in his hands. His stomach has sunk lower than ever before, and he can't believe the worst coming out of his ex-wife's mouth. We see Jean using the suit to hang herself, to stage her own attack. Ray wonders that all this while since the murders, Bruce has been asking the same question again and again. Who benefits? Who benefits? Who benefits? And he finally has the answer. When a family member of a hero is killed, the family members of other heroes benefit. Ray can't take it anymore, and he starts screaming at Sue. How could she do this? Sue was their friend. Ray's gonna make her realize all the wrong she's done. He's gonna tell her as it should be. Don't call it an accident. Don't insult her like that, Jean. You hired Boomerang and sent Tim's dad a gun to shoot him. Ray gets a glimpse into the anger Jean holds inside when he utters Boomerang's name. She scowls. Don't go defending Boomerang. He's killed far more people than… But before she can say any more, Ray cuts her off. He calls her deluded and makes her see that she's orphaned Tim. She begs Ray to not see her in this light. She hired someone cheap because she hoped Tim's dad would pull the trigger and be safe. Ray can't believe he ever married Jean. Married this woman. Do you have any idea what you've done, Jean? Of course. I brought us together just like… just like it used to be. Ray stares at her. He can't believe the words coming out of her mouth. Is it delusion? Or was this all pre-planned? Does she really feel no remorse? Is she putting on this act just so Ray would stay again? Jean's demeanor completely changes. What? Now you're mad? Don't look at me like that, Ray. You should be thanking me. This is it. This is what she was hiding. Here we go. She goes on to tell Ray to cut her some slack and give up this condemnation, this tantrum that he's having. He's no Bruce to be condemning her. Ray's scowl grows by each passing second and Jean finally breaks. What are you going to do? Punch me? Take me to the cops and lock me away? I'm your wife, Ray. You can't just lock me in a cell and toss the key. The next panel opens up in Arkham Asylum. We realize Ray has admitted Jean into the asylum and this is the day she is being taken away. He stands outside with his head hung low as the doctor asks if Ray's okay. Ray doesn't say anything and just walks away. After a few steps, he raises his head, looks toward the sky and says, Yeah. Ray's Justice League signal device then buzzes but Ray doesn't answer. Simply hands it to the doctor, asks him to take care of the device and continues walking away. But, but Dr. Palmer, it says, ah, it says here the League needs you. No, they don't says Ray as he continues to walk away. Ray doesn't say more and his last request to the doctor is to take care of his wife as he walks out of the asylum. Inside, Ray is grieving like never before. He just wants to get away, go away from everything after all this happened. And as the asylum's gate grows smaller and smaller in the background, Ray finally gives in to his feeling and transforms into his smaller self and continues growing smaller with each passing second. He weeps and weeps as he grows to the size of an atom, because after all this happened, after his wife killed their friend, orphaned another friend, just to get him back, he's never felt smaller in his life. Over the next week, life slowly goes back to normal for everyone. Black Canary and Zatanna continue with their daily patrol. Jean stays locked inside Arkham Asylum. Black Lightning and Katana continue dating. Clark continues to help his parents back in Smallville. The recent events weigh heavily on him, but Mark Kent is there to help him through it all. Even the villains go back to normal. News about Jean's stay at Arkham starts breaking out. It's revealed that she was tortured by fellow inmates, a news that makes the front page of the Inquirer. The recent events make many superheroes evaluate their lives, and one of them is Firehawk. She decides that she's done with this phase of her life and would like to move on. Lorraine is ready to give up the mantle of Firehawk and go back to her normal life, go back home to her father. But those affected by the recent events are the ones that have been hit the worst. Tim now spends most of his days lying in his bed in the dark. Dick makes it a point to call him and talk to him each day, but Tim never picks up. Ralph still can't believe Sue is gone and confides in Oliver who tells him to talk to her. She's still a part of his heart so he can talk to her. A week later, we see Green Arrow in the Flash at the League's headquarters. Flash asks about Ray but Oliver shakes his head. They haven't heard a thing, but Carter ensures that he reaches out to Ray three times every day. Oliver tells Wally that Ralph actually went to see Jean in Arkham. Despite his protests, Ralph wanted to do it. He wanted closure. Oliver asked Dinah to accompany Ralph and according to her, Jean was on heavy medications. She kept playing with her hospital bracelet, thinking it was her wedding band. Wally can't believe how ruthless Jean was when it came to the murder and the aftermath. Oliver nods and tells Wally that if you want a good enemy, then you should choose a friend because they know exactly where and how to hurt you. Wally stares at Oliver for a few seconds and then says, You're a real whack job, aren't you? Someone has to be. Wally changes the subject and brings up talking to Clark about Oliver. Oliver knows exactly what they're planning and raises his arm in protest as he sips his coffee. Oliver's a reserved member of the League and that's enough. He has no plans of joining it full time. But that isn't what Wally was going to ask. Clark and him just want to go to dinner with Oliver. 
as he used to do in the old days with Clark and Barry. Oliver smiles, raises his cap and tells Wally that he'd love to go to dinner with them. It's good news, but Wally refuses to smile or be happy. He's still creeped out by them wiping Bruce's mind and Oliver knows this. He strikes a conversation about it with Wally and the kid still thinks that it was a bad idea for them to wipe Bruce's memories. He thinks that their actions ruined the League. And it's exactly what Oliver thought at first, but then time passed and the League endured. Because that's what the League was designed to do. Always endure. We see Bruce visiting his parents' grave. He stands there in full costume with flowers in his hand. And when he bends down to place the flowers at the grave, he removes his cowl and says, Mom, Dad, please take care of Jack Drake and our friend, Sue. We're back in Ralph's apartment. Everything's been fixed and every item has been placed where it should be. Ralph is talking to someone, reasoning why he didn't go to Lois and Clark's dinner today. And it's because Lois is a bad cook, but he can't tell that to Clark for obvious reasons. The conversation's awfully joyful and Ralph seems happy. The photo of him and Sue, locked in each other's arms, is neatly placed on the table. It sounds like the other party is inviting Ralph for dinner tomorrow, but he politely declines. He already has plans to go out for dinner with Wally and Kyle. We see that he's been sent fresh flowers by someone and on his card are the words, Deepest Sympathies. We see that Ralph's trash can tells a different story compared to the rest of his house. It's filled to the brim with bottles of gin gold, the drink he was researching in his early days, which led to him becoming the elongated man in the first place. Pizza boxes are also piled up beside the trash can. Ralph continues talking, now recounting a joke to the other person he heard from Wally. We slowly continue making our way toward Ralph as we see the hallway lined with certificates, awards, and honors, all learned by him and Sue over the course of their lives. In the bedroom, there's another picture of Sue on the dressing table, smiling and grinning lovingly at the camera. Ralph's in his bathroom talking, and as we head inside, we see that he's talking to the mirror. He's pretending to talk to Sue. Ralph shuts the light off in the bathroom and gets in the bed, ready to sleep. He's pretending to sleep beside Sue, who says that she has to go. Ralph takes this in good spirits. No, I'm fine, bun. I'm great. Uh, great, then. I I'll talk to you tomorrow. Good night, Sue. He extends his arm and turns off the bedroom light, and we see him say one last time, I love you, too. Ralph has taken Oliver's advice, and things finally seem to be improving for him.